It was the early 1940s. Average annual income was $1,900. A house cost $3,500. A new car, $900. A loaf of bread was just a dime, while a gallon of milk was 62 cents. Our country was deeply involved in the Second World War. Overseas, U.S. bombers were now beginning to take the war to the enemy. Heavy with bombs, they were no match for the enemy's fast maneuvering fighters. Our fighters, such as the P-47 Thunderbolts and P-38 Lightnings, escorted the bombers as far as they could. Unfortunately, when the fuel ran low, they would have to turn back, leaving the bombers to carry on their missions alone. Left for long periods of time, the bombers would now have to fend for themselves. The enemy knew our fighters did not have the range to follow our bombers all the way to the targets and back. So they would wait. Wait until our fighters had to turn back. When they did, they attacked. In one week alone, in October of 1943, 148 bombers and 1,500 crew members were lost. North American Aviation had developed a fighter for the British Air Force, the P-51, powered by the American-built Allison engine. Named the Mustang by the British, it performed well down low, but was no match at altitude with the British Spitfires, powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. With a more sophisticated supercharger, the Merlin could maintain its rated power to a much higher altitude than the Allison. Merlin-powered Mustangs were tested, and a great fighter was born. With the Mustang's ability to carry large external fuel tanks and the Merlin's good fuel economy, the air war now began to take on a different look. With over 450 gallons of fuel, the Mustangs now had a range of over 2,000 miles and had the capability to escort the bombers on their entire long-range missions. Deadly, fast, high-flying, and fuel-efficient, the Mustang became known as the plane that defeated the Luftwaffe in World War II. Costing in the neighborhood of $40,000 in 1943, a new P-51 Mustang is unavailable today at any price. But if you're lucky enough to find a project and can afford it, you can restore one to mint condition. One like this rare, early, and perfectly restored P-51C model. Current value of this aircraft? Well, let's just say you could have purchased several squadrons of Mustangs back in 1943 for the same price. Kermit Weeks is the creator of Fantasy of Flight, a Central Florida tourist attraction that is based on man's fascination with flight. Kermit strives for a high degree of originality in all his aircraft. Restoration of this project was done in Salinas, California at the Cal Pacific Air Motive Facility, owned by Art Teeters. Art and his crew specialize in restoring and the building of parts for P-51s. Kermit has a number of projects continually under restoration in various locations around the world. These usually take years, sometimes decades, to complete. Earlier, while visiting Art to test fly his P-51D model Mustang, Kermit decided to check the progress of one of his other projects. Of course, this is the same model Mustang here. This thing only looks like it's, what do you think, a couple of months away? Yeah, it's uh, ready to go on the wing, uh, Kermit. Really? Yeah. It uh, was all new as far as skins, ribs, uh, a lot of new parts. Kermit prides himself on the perfection of his restored aircraft. He requires the planes to be exactly as they were when they came off the assembly line, down to the last detail. Original parts are restored whenever possible. If parts are not available, they are manufactured to original specs. Plating of hardware, decals, placards and markings are all matched to the original prints. Even the labeling on the wiring is coded to the original World War II manuals. 
the power for this Mustang comes from a 1500 horsepower Merlin engine. This makes the P-51 an extremely fast and versatile aircraft. Every component was drilled apart and stripped for inspection. No one knew what might be found beneath the exterior skins. Airframe parts that were corroded or damaged beyond repair would have to be newly manufactured. New ribs can be constructed right in the shop with the use of this 200-ton hydraulic press. Perfect new parts are pressed out to original specs. The mating of the wing and the fuselage is a milestone in any aircraft restoration. However, while the major components come together to make it look more complete, there is still a lot of work left to do. Fuel and hydraulic lines, as well as wiring, must still be connected. Every system must be checked for leaks, freedom of movement, function, and many other details. Kermit's insistence on perfection applies to the outside of his planes as well. Artists recreate the original markings based on research of old photographs. In the case of this Mustang, it was painted with a red tail assembly. This was the signature marking of the Tuskegee Airmen, who were the first African-American pilots to fly during World War II. Um, I, there was a little bit of a dilemma in deciding how to paint this airplane and how I was going to restore it. We finally came up with the fact that we were going to do it as a military airplane, and we ended up deciding to paint it up in the colors of Lee Archer, who was the highest scoring Tuskegee ace in uh, World War II. So uh, we're going to get a chance to hook up with him a little bit later on. He's still alive. I'm sure there's a lot of stories, and uh, I think he's very excited that we're going to do this airplane in his colors. Seems like a trippy guy, and he's very excited about it. Yeah, I'm sure he never thought this would come true. He's fast. Coming up next, Kermit Weeks reunites Lee Archer with the Macon Bell. The P-51 Mustang was a critically needed fighter at this stage of the war. Pilots could now use these fast and long-range fighter planes to escort and protect the bombers on their long-range missions. One special group in particular was the 332nd Fighter Group, who later became known as the Tuskegee Airmen. While World War II was raging overseas, another kind of war was being fought stateside, one against racism and segregation. As in most parts of society, the armed forces were segregated. African Americans were welcome to join the service as foot soldiers or serve in support capacities, but they were not allowed to fly in the Army Air Force. When it was all over, that it was a waste of my time, that there was never going to be a colored pilot, that there was never going to be a unit they could go to, and that uh, we didn't have the qualifications to be an airplane pilot, and they went through the whole list, uh, including such ridiculous things as uh, lack of coordination to fly an airplane at all, the most ridiculous statement in history. In 1939, the Army Air Corps approved the training of black pilots at the Tuskegee Institute near Montgomery, Alabama. But it wasn't until 1941 when the Tuskegee Army Airfield went into construction, that there would be a facility completed to fully train black military pilots. As expected, there was a great resistance to this. The government decided on the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, what the government decided, after being impressed by Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, that they would have a group of young African Americans and put them in flying training, and see whether or not they could learn to fly. With the assumption that it would fail and we'd get this thing out of the way, we'd have those tests uh, stop bothering us. Critics were certain that this Tuskegee experiment would fail. This misconception was soon to be proven wrong. Pilots from the 99th Fighter Squadron made their historic first flight into battle on June 2nd, 1943. Through the course of the war, Tuskegee pilots flew over 3,000 sorties and missions. Incredibly, of the 450 pilots, only 66 were killed in action. 
As escorts, the Tuskegee pilots never lost a single bomber to enemy aircraft. Painting the nose and tail sections of their planes red, the Tuskegee pilots were christened the Red Tail Angels. Bomber pilots knew that when they saw those red tails, they were in protective hands. I brought back airplanes with large holes in them. I haven't figured out yet whether I was shot by another aircraft or whether it was an aircraft fire. It's one of the few pictures I have of an aircraft that had very severe damage. The picture shows me standing there looking at the hole in the wing that's like a door, <laughs> and that was it. Archer distinguished himself in battle, shooting down more enemy aircraft than any other Tuskegee pilot. During the war, Archer flew several different models of fighters, including the P-51C Mustang. His aircraft was named Ina the Macon Bell. Ina was to become Lee's wife. It is easy to understand why Kermit chose to honor Lee Archer and the Tuskegee Airmen by restoring his aircraft in the colors of the Macon Bell, making it possible for pilot and airplane to reunite. Hey, Lee, I can't wait for you to see this airplane. Oh, I can't wait either. This is great. Is that gorgeous or what? Yeah. Beautiful. Looks better now than it did when it was new. Oh, All right, man. there's my Hepcat. <laughs> Is that a what, was that a, a jitterbug and a? Uh, we call it the Hepcat. The Hepcat. H E P cat, but it's a, it's a jitterbug guy. You know, that, and it was a copy off of uh, a fellow by the name of Wendell o. Pruitt. He put this on his airplane, and since he was one of my idols. Uh, I put it on mine. Oh, that's and great. Uh, Lee, one of the things that we're really proud of is we put back all uh, the original armament stuff. Uh, all of these ammo chutes and boxes, there were no original ones in the world. We actually uh, made these original off the drawings uh, with the gun heaters, the firing solenoids work, um, and actually there's the, the handle to actually charge the guns before you take off. Most of the pilots would try to get their armor to tell them where in front of the airplane they wanted the, sh the bullets to converge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, some, some people were experts at it. I didn't. I just left it to the armorer, and he did the best he could. I would have paid the government to fly this airplane. Really? I really was that fond of it. Really? It was a well, that's good. Well, I can't wait to fly it now. <laughs> good for you. I think you'll love it. Uh, I spent a lot of time in this airplane. Well, this, this is, is as great. original as if you look in the manual, it's exactly as the uh, as the drawings say. All the instruments, the switches, all the armament stuff is where it's supposed to be. It is perfect. This is a perfect replica of the old hmm. airplane. This you, is the you've done a wonderful job. The only thing missing is the parachute and. <laughs> and the mission. Well, we're going to throw a parachute in when we go fly this thing, that's for sure. I cannot believe that I'm back in one of these again. It'll give me so much pleasure to see it fly. Well, let's go do it. Coming up next, Kermit test flies the Macon Bell. After years of restoration, the P-51C Mustang, now known as Ina the Macon Bell, is now ready for its long-awaited test flight. Kermit Weeks collects his aircraft because of his passion for flying. He feels it's an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to fly them. While other owners might get someone else to do the job, Kermit looks forward to performing the test flights himself. gone over all the emergency procedures. So many of these parts are new. Engine's been running good. Sure hope we checked everything. All of the time, money, and effort that went into this. 15 years, hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
tens of thousands of man hours. What could go wrong? Proper over speed on takeoff? If I have a problem where it doesn't feel right before I lift off, I'll abort. If the engine quits after takeoff, gear up and belly in. If there's a fire and I'm low, get on the ground quickly and get out. If I've got altitude, pull the canopy release, bail out. No matter how many times I do this, I still get a tinge of butterflies. It'll all be over soon. Hopefully successful. With the engine overheating soon after takeoff, and now with less than a minute in the airplane, Hermit was forced to land. That's a beautiful first flight. It wouldn't cool down, so what I did is I went down, I pulled the emergency door, which opened the scoop another four inches. Caught a few, uh, oh, got a few, got a few caught Art and his crew made an inspection and checked things over. After a few minor adjustments, the Megan Bell was ready for another test run. Great airplane, great pilot. Kermit was satisfied that everything was running okay and decided to leave the airport traffic area. Hello, this is Kermit. Lee, do you hear me? I hear you five by five. Go ahead, please. Hey, this thing's pretty awesome. Uh, feels great. Everything seems to be running okay. It sounds great. It looks great. And I'm surprised that uh, I'm not ready to hang you because I'd rather be sitting in there than sitting out here. I thought I'd fly it over the mountain. I've been telling uh, Art and them that I don't see how you resisted doing a roll or anything like that for the last uh, three or four flights. <laughs> I tried a thousand times to tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing, and uh, this is something great. And I hope that you understand how I feel. Uh, it's difficult to do, I know, but I feel this is something wonderful for me and for the Tuskegee Airmen. I'm gonna go back to tower. I'll make a couple of passes. Good. 
Pat Tower, uh, Mustang 1204 is with you on a high right downwind for 3-1. I'd like to make a couple of low approaches. Mission 7 Delta Bravo traffic on runway 8, the Mustang doing a low approach, we're making a right downwind. That's not a Mustang, okay. that's the making Bell. I'm going to get you in the cockpit here, I'll get you to sign. Okay. Well, thank you, Lee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Kermit, this is, this is something. All right, somebody give me a glass. Never mind. To the airplane. A toast to Kermit. If we all get tickets to heaven and you don't get one too, we'll give our tickets to someone else and go to hell with you. Wow. Cheers, I'll drink to that. <laughs> as long as they've got P-51 Mustangs, I'm happy. That'll do it. Kermit Weeks, Fantasy of Flight. Uh, we got a great day going on here in uh, April of uh, 2004. We're hosting the AVG reunion, and we've got 21 of the original Flying Tigers from World War, World War II. Five are pilots, the rest are ground crew. Uh, we got a couple of P-40s out on the ramp, and uh, a little bit later I'm gonna be giving uh, two of them rides in the airplane. I flew three of the pilots yesterday. We're gonna do the other two today, and uh, it's a great tribute to a great bunch of guys. So. Uh, Appreciate everybody coming out and uh, enjoy uh, the video here. It's a very, very neat deal to be able to introduce these gentlemen. Uh, I certainly knew about them when I was growing up and reading books. Uh, my mother and I think all the people that uh, were school kids back in those days, uh, if you didn't know how to draw a P-40 on your front of your notebook, uh, you weren't, weren't part of the, uh, the, the crowd, that's for sure. And these guys, I've, I've had a chance to, to meet a couple of them over the years at some of their other reunions. We've had an opportunity to uh, uh, keep in touch with a few of them, and they're really neat guys. We'd like to welcome them to Fantasy of Flight and Florida.
buzzing the field turned out to be a little pastime. Uh, Charlie Bond has been known to buzz the Taj Mahal. Uh, at one point, uh, in, in a raid, the Japanese caught them by surprise. Uh, everybody dived into slit trenches except for Charlie Bond. He actually made it into one of those aircraft and went up there and shot down a couple of aircraft. He was so proud of himself that he started to do a victory roll but what he didn't know was that there was two Japanese fighters on his tail. And Doc Rich, who was on the ground, saw this. And if you can believe this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not making this up. Doc Rich grabs his 45 and he's running out in the field shooting at those Japanese aircraft. But uh, that was the second time Charlie got shot down. Unfortunately, he, uh, he survived. And was just coming down, opening fire on one I spotted me when I got hit with something big because the engine quit and uh, I bailed out too low, which was buggered up and uh, wound up as a POW. Eventually, uh, Terrence Ferret, after my wounds healed, I was in the River Kwai uh, uh, railroad bit and Alec Guinness and I had a hell of a time building that bridge. <laughs> when the war began for us, at Pearl Harbor, the Army Air Corps scrambled to try and take on this onslaught of the Japanese. And the only effective fighting force at the time were the Flying Tigers. And so the thinking was that they would have the Army Air Corps come in and induct the volunteers from the Army Air Corps, Navy Air Corps, Marine Air Corps into the Army. And in the interviews that I did, uh, there was a general sense of, yeah, you know, I'd be willing to do that. Uh, I need some time off. I need to rest a little bit. I mean, they've been fighting day and night. And the Army Air Corps sent a guy who perhaps was the worst possible choice, or maybe they did it deliberately. We'll never know. His name was Clayton Bissell. And Bissell was brought to Kunming. And they gathered the Flying Tigers together. And as Joe Rosberg talks about it, you got a bunch of guys with beards, and they got 45s hanging from there. And they just got off the flight line, and their lack of sleep and all that. And this guy gets up there and says, you know, you're pretty famous in the United States, but that's just press. You know, what you've really accomplished out here isn't all that much. And uh, we want you to join the Army Air Corps. And if you don't join the Army Air Corps, when you arrive back in the States, you're going to be drafted as privates in the infantry. Well, this is no way to talk to a group of people who have risked their lives and knew what battle was. In fact, this guy had the audacity to say that they should join because there's a war going on. Well, I think these guys knew there was a war going on. The Chinese refuelers that when the P-40 would come up, the Chinese would come up and they would refuel the aircraft, and they didn't speak English. And so some of the ground crew decided to teach them a saying. And any time an airplane lands and dignitaries come off, what you need to do is say these words because it's a show of respect. And so, as the legend has it, Clayton Bissell, this general who insulted the Flying Tigers, got off the airplane, walked off the little plank thing there, and all these Chinese refuelers all were bowing, going, piss on Bissell, piss on Bissell. I joined the Air Force in 1937. At that time, in the United States, we had 12 B-17s, and they were all in Langley Field. We had four fighter groups in the whole United States. So it may give you a little idea we didn't have nothing, and we went to war, and we volunteered to fight. Okay, I'll go ahead and get everything up. I'll take us up to about 1,500 feet, and 
and uh, get her all trimmed out for you, and then we can uh, go from there. Right. Okay, here we go. I mean, you were taxiing awesome, like you hadn't, uh, like you hadn't forgot a thing. Well, I, I haven't kept up with my flying, so I've been flown for about 10 years. Really? When was the last time you flew P-40? July 28, 1942. Unbelievable. So what's it feel like to uh, have been back up in one? Just like yesterday. Just like yesterday. <laughs> What did it feel like back to be, to be back in there and feel it under your power? Very good. Just uh, a little bit. I was having a hard time taxing, so, but normally I used to keep the window open and look out the sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was flying. And as a matter of fact, I guess an old Navy habit. We left it open until we were airborne and then rolled it back because it was more quiet. What's it like having the opportunity to be able to do this? Well, I'll tell you, you got an officer and a gentleman there, I'll tell you. He gave me that opportunity. What kind of a memory is going to be for you? Well, it made me think back, you know, the days that we were flying the tunnel hops around. Okay, you go ahead and taxi it. 
and uh, it's got a steerable tailwheel. If you push with your feet, it'll actually steer. You don't need to touch the stick or anything. There you go. Now, and you got to lead with it. So now, right rudder. That's it. a lot different than I expected. As a matter of fact, I'm tickled to death that they did this. It reminded me when I flew, learned to fly the first airplane, rough on control. And uh, uh, it, it, it brought so many memories back, so many memories, that uh, it's still, in my opinion, is the greatest airplane ever built. <laughs> it's sort of like uh, swimming. You know, once you learn to swim, you know how. Flying an airplane, you'll never forget the basics of it. Uh, you'd be a little rough on control, but the whole objective is be smooth and you're flying. And you forget a little bit of that, but it came back fast, you know, on just maybe a 15-minute flight. What a thrill it was to have that ride. I didn't think I'd ever get a chance again. It, it was really a highlight for me, to tell you the truth. I uh, had a little bit of problem keeping a, a correct altitude. I mean, <laughs> you kind of lose the touch. Uh, it's very easy to be climbing too much or, or uh, losing too much altitude, but, uh, but uh, after a little while, it began to feel uh, Real, real good. There's hardly any wind. I think I'm going to take off this way. Okay. <laughs> I 
guy has been my friend here for, what, 18 years or so? Pretty, pretty, pretty close. I actually had to put them to work uh, 1,500 times. They signed their names on uh, a lot of these pictures. And uh, I'm really proud to introduce uh, over here uh, Bob Lair, the second squadron, and uh, Dick Rossi, also another one of my heroes. This is uh, Charlie Bond from the Adam and Eve squadron as well. And uh, Peter Wright. Uh, one of the fellows who uh, flew in the Salween Gorge mission depicted in here. And uh, one of my favorite guys of all time, uh, Tex Hill, who is actually the pilot of the plane uh, depicted in this uh, battle in the Salween Gorge. And uh, we had a very special presentation uh, to our friend uh, Kermit. Just a, an incredibly beautiful museum. Just done a beautiful job. We'd just like to present this uh, on behalf of uh, me as the artist and these heroes of mine from the Flying Tigers. Here you go, Kermit. This is the rear seat in the only dual control P-40 that flies on the planet. And I would like to get these two, five guys, I would like to get these five guys to sign the seat. And I've already started the message. And it says, may the spirit of the ABG Flying Tigers be with whomever flies in this seat. Well, cheers, guys. So a great flight, great bunch of guys. To all the ones that didn't make it back.
Kermit Weeks has been technically fascinated with many things from an early age, but his direction in life was set after hearing the song Snoopy and the Red Baron on the radio when he was 13 years old. From that point on, he began a lifelong interest in aircraft, history, and flight. At age 16, Kermit bought a set of drawings for $40 and began construction of his first flyable home-built aircraft. It was also at this time that he joined EAA. For his second project, Kermit designed and built the Weeks Special. In this aircraft, he made the U.S. aerobatic team at 24 years old. During his first World Aerobatic Championships in 1978, he placed second overall in the Special, winning three silvers and a bronze. Kermit built and developed another aircraft called the Weeks Solution, eventually won 20 medals at the world level, and became a two-time U.S. national aerobatic champion. One of the proudest days of his life was when he taxied into a ramp full of friends in his new P-51D Mustang, Cripes a Mighty, at age 25. The bug had bit, and bit hard. While he began to collect more aircraft, he began to work with the local airport authorities to build a museum in southwest Miami. Kermit outgrew the Weeks Air Museum facility before the doors had even opened. So in 1987, he purchased 250 acres in central Florida and began to develop his dream, Fantasy of Flight, which houses aircraft from the beginning of flight through early jets. Warbirds are a major portion of the collection. The collection includes more than 160 aircraft and is the largest private collection in the world, rivaling many national museums. Fantasy of Flight will celebrate its 10th anniversary next month. Kermit doesn't collect anything that does not have the potential to fly one day. His Warbird collection includes every major fighter and bomber the Americans flew during the Second World War, as well as the largest private collection of World War II British aircraft. Kermit and his crew set a new standard with the winning of Oshkosh Grand Champion Warbird with their restoration of his Mustang Cripes a Mighty. After suffering damage from Hurricane Andrew, it was restored to an even higher standard and won Grand Champion again 10 years later. His latest Grand Champion winner, a rare P-51C Mustang, is his tribute to the Tuskegee Airmen. Kermit's dream for fantasy of flight is to take the metaphor of what flying symbolizes to us all. Freedom, pushing our boundaries, and reaching beyond ourselves, and take the attraction industry to a new level.